Anthony, thank you for uh, the kind of comment a moment ago. I'm always, uh, I'm always very happy to point out that the very first public description of what is now JATS BITS, formerly the NLMDTD, was given at this conference back in December of 2002. Uh, so that, that's always a, a very fond memory for me of going back in uh, the tide of this particular conference. Um, as you just pointed out, I'm sort of the opposite bookend to Evan's talk this morning. Uh, if there's a theme that's been running through the day, I th or two themes, it's sort of data and workflow, and I'm going to come really try to tie both of those together in my presentation, uh, looking at, taking a revised look at um, metadata in the e-production workflow. Uh, but I want to start by sort of harkening back to the good old days, uh, about 25 years or so ago. Uh, back then, the author would submit a manuscript, um, typically typewritten. It might be longhand, um, as in this example, it might actually be both longhand and typewritten. Uh, for those of you who are curious, this is a page from an Albert Einstein manuscript. Back then, they had no way of doing math on the typewriter, so this is what he had to do. Um, the manuscript would be peer-reviewed. Uh, typically, you know, publishers would ask for the triple space, so there's lots of room to write comments on them. Uh, the revised manuscript would be resubmitted by the author after uh, doing the revisions. Uh, a few bits of metadata might be added to the cover page. Uh, I apologize, this isn't actually a, uh, a real manuscript. Uh, I spent hours on Google trying to find an image of a typewritten scientific manuscript. And the only thing I came up with was that Albert Einstein one, but this at least has a received date on it that I've circled in red here as an example of a little bit of metadata that might be added to a typewritten manuscript. Um, that manuscript would then be edited on paper. Uh, this is actually a not so old, this manuscript is only about 10 years old. It's uh, from one of the last publishers I know that went over from uh, handwritten editing to electronic editing. It's the New England Journal of Medicine, circa 2003. Um, that manuscript would then be rekeyed. It would be typeset. It would be proof. Uh, the corrections would be typeset. You had to check the copyright forms, and then you would print the uh, manuscript, uh, or into you'd, you would accumulate manuscripts into a printed issue. Remember issues? Um, um, what you said there is wrong, actually. You didn't check the copyright forms. You just assumed they were all there. <laughs> That's really, I know, I can say that's an empirical knowledge. Okay, okay, so this was the quality assurance check on metadata circa 25 years ago. Um, the post-print workflow is that you'd ship your print package to the library. You'd wait for the third-party indexers to pick it up. You'd publish an occasional correction, and very rarely you'd publish a retraction. And ultimately, the result looked something like this, sitting out on a library shelf. So now let's bring it forward, or let's flash back only about 10 years ago. Uh, by this point, electronic submission was reasonably well entrenched. Uh, we had the beginnings of a transmittal package accompanying the accepted files. Uh, and we had some, what I'll call, non-redundant data that would be typically copy and pasted from the transmittal or just retyped from the transmittal in, <coughs> excuse me, into the Microsoft Word file. Uh, that would be information such as an article type, an article ID, uh, received revised accepted dates. Um, the electronic file uh, by this point, by 2004, was typically being edited on screen and then you would find various nefarious ways to get that into the typesetting environment. Uh, in theory, you were still checking the copyright forms, and at some point in this workflow, XML would be produced. And I'm being agnostic here as to whether it was being produced um, before composition or after composition or even uh, at the point uh, of acceptance, depending on the workflow. Um, the post-publication workflow would be to post the published article online excuse me, upload your metadata to Crossref. Uh, you would ship out to libraries, and I'm actually being very nonspecific as to whether you're shipping print or electronic at this point. Um, you would, in the, this was sort of the early days of archiving, so you might do something about archiving PDF and XML. You'd publish an occasional correction or erratum, and you would publish now a rare retraction rather than a very rare retraction. But now if we bring it forward to 2013, we have a bunch of new initiatives. Just 
taking the manuscript and publishing online, essentially recreating a, an enhanced version of a print journal online is no longer good enough. Because we've got a bunch of new initiatives that we're looking at now that we're fundamentally entrenched in an electronic world. The first is ORCID. Does everyone here know what ORCID is? Okay, I'm seeing most hands go up, great. Um, this is a slide actually from uh, an ORCID presentation a couple of months ago. You can see how well entrenched the ORCIDs are in the workflow uh, in terms of the authors, the reviewers. Uh, they're actually, what's missing here is on that XML to crossref, there should be an ORCID in there because one of the key points in this is you do want to get the ORCID to crossref. Another big new initiative this year is Fundref, which is taking off actually faster than Crossref thought it would take off, which is accumulating all of the information about funders at Crossref because this way the grant agencies can track through to see what the impact is of the grants they're giving on the publication record. And all of this information can be coalesced. And for example, publisher can see which granting agencies are the ones that uh, are most often funding papers that they're publishing, which of course begins to have a business implication if you, think it's, if you think about some of the business implications around open access and some of the special deals that uh, funding agencies have made with respect to open access requirements for some of the uh, research that they fund. Uh, and another big new initiative is Chorus. Uh, those of you who were here yesterday heard Howard Ratner talk a little bit about this. Uh, Chorus pulls a lot of this together. Uh, but one of the fundamental ideas behind this Chorus design is that you as the publishers can retain control of your content rather than having it go into a government repository. And the way you're doing that is making sure that the metadata is all there to seamlessly meet all the requirements of making that content visible. So let's flash forward now to next year and think about what the workflow needs to be in light of initiatives like ORCID and Fundref and uh, Chorus. Well, as happened 10 years ago, the manuscript was submitted electronically, but now what's happened is with each passing year, the author, when they submit, has to fill out ever more forms in the online submission system. I'm sorry, Richard, I'm looking over at you. But it's the reality. This is what publishers want. They want to collect more data. So the author may now have to sign up for ORCID if they don't already have one at the point of submission. They'll add their ORCID to the submission. Uh, they need to fill in the rest of the authors and the affiliations. I actually had a conversation with a publisher at lunch who said, you know, we actually really want to take the author and affiliation uh, data from this transmittal rather than the manuscript. And we're trying to push all the authors to do that. But some of them just don't get that. They're not filling it in. They say, ah, I just have to fill it myself because you know what? All that other data, it's in the Word file. I already put the authors and affiliations in there. Don't make me repeat it. I just filled in one of those forms, actually, as an academic. So. OK. And how many co-authors did you have? And how many of them did you fill in on the uh, online submission? I only filled in my own one. I you only, only filled in your own? Oh, yeah. Okay. Then, I was surprised. Okay, exhibit A, right over here. Exhibit A for I was Anthony. horrified, actually. <laughs> okay, so that's one example of what's going on. Um, you've now also, with some publishers, uh, you've got to add the funding information. Well, I was talking to Evan at another meeting uh, last month, and he pointed out that even though uh, AIP wants their authors to add the funding information when they submit their manuscript in eJournal Press, they're not getting at least a 20% non-compliance rate. Authors who just sort of skip that step. Why? Guess what? It's in the Word file. It's in the acknowledgment paragraph. Don't make me do this again. By the way, Howard Ratner made, I think it was Howard, made an interesting point at STM in Frankfurt when he pointed out that the typical researcher spends 40% of their time on administrative tasks. That's 40% of their time that they're not devoting to the research, and that's why they're in the business. They're not in research because they want to do administrative tasks. And so what's happened is we've burdened the uh, researcher with more and more of this stuff that they've got to do. They've got to fill out conflict of interest and disclosure forms. There may be uh, payment. Uh, th this may be the point in the workflow where they're paying their author charges or at least setting up the mechanism so that if the manuscript is accepted, they can pay the author charges. So this has all become much bigger than that simple received stamp on the cover page of the typewritten manuscript. So now when the manuscript is accepted, we've got a transmittal that's accompanying the uh, accepted files. And we've got to do a reconciliation between the transmittal and the manuscript 
of the metadata. Say what? This is new. And I want you to hold on to this thought of reconciling the transmittal and the metadata from the manuscript. I'm going to loop back to that, so I'm going to keep going. The file is going to be typeset. XML is going to be produced at some stage. I'm skipping the whole copy editing stage at this point. Half the publishers seem to have given that up. Uh, you're going to check, instead of on the copyright forms, you're going to check that the Creative, copyright, Creative Commons copyright is correct. And then you may add uh, enriched metadata uh, and semantics of the sort that Evan was talking about this morning and some of the other publishers were talking about uh, in the middle of the day as sort of a post-publication layer of semantic enrichment. Um, and then you're going to post that all online. Uh, you're going to upload your metadata to Crossref, uh, PubMed, possibly some others. Uh, are we even shipping print to libraries anymore? Uh, which is why I've got question marks on that. Uh, you now have to comply with all of the various requirements of the different funding agencies that may have funded the research that's just been published. Uh, you may have to post that uh, one or more archives, uh, PMC, UK PMC, Portico. Uh, you're going to publish the occasional correction or erratum, and you're now going to publish instead of the uh, very rare retraction or the rare retraction, we're going to publish, unfortunately, the occasional retraction. Uh, anyone who reads Retraction Watch knows that the rate of retraction seems to be going up faster than the rate of new publication. So we have all these new initiatives that are going on, ORCID, FundRef, Crossref Metadata Services, Chorus, et cetera, and these all rely on new metadata. You've got an ORCID, which in theory actually has to be authenticated. You, just, you can't just slap it in there. You actually have to have each author verify this is my correct ORCID. You have funding information with an institutional ID. If you've taken a look at how FundRef works, with Crossref, you've actually got the Elsevier vocabulary of 4,000 funding agencies, and you've got to match up against those agencies. You've got license information, Creative Commons license information. You've got to make sure that you've actually got that correct with the right attributes. And then you may have updated article versions. You've got to do things like crossmark. And by the way, a personal plea, those of you who are not doing crossmark, please start doing it. And those of you who think, oh, I can only do crossmark on new content because it impacts the PDF. No, you can actually deposit crossmark records without doing the PDFs so that all of your retractions, if nothing else, all of your retractions can be on record at Crossref. Why do you want the retractions on record at Crossref? Because a lot of systems now are sort of looking into Crossref from the reference list saying, oh, Somebody's trying to cite a retracted reference. Let's flag this for the editor because they need to go back to the author and say, wait a second, you've got something wrong with your research if you're building it on retracted references. So please go back and at least deposit your retractions, even if you don't do all your other corrections with crossmark records. And don't worry about the PDFs. It's not a requirement. So all of this new metadata is bringing us more complex workflows. We're collecting more data from the authors. We've got more data integration that the publishers are required to do. We've got more metadata being sent to more different indexing services. And ultimately, we've got more full text going to more different archives. This is a much bigger can of worms than we expected to open up when we started doing online publication. So let's take a look at this metadata in the workflow. I've got a few basic rules of metadata. Rule number one, enter it once and get it right. Don't make people enter metadata more than once because if you do, they'll start getting it wrong and you'll have a reconciliation problem. Rule number two, or rule, rules number two, three, and four, my don'ts. Don't do manually what you can do automatically. Find ways to do things automatically. Engage some really talented developers to build a little bit of glue for you to do things automatically. Bill was waxing eloquent about Cam the scripts that Cambridge has. Obviously, Cambridge has thought about doing things automatically. Don't burden researchers with extra administrative tasks. You're only going to chase them to another journal that has fewer administrative tasks. Don't use copy and paste. Copy and paste is inherently error prone. It's less error prone than retyping, but it's better to have automated systems to tie all this together. Do validate early and often. This is a variation on the rules of Chicago where you vote early and often. In this case, we're validating early and often. Do single source your metadata along with ideally single sourcing your entire workflow. Create XML and from that derive PDF, EPUB, and so on. 
And finally, what you really want to think about, and this is my biggest takeaway for today, is you want to think about re-optimizing your workflow around the metadata so that you make it as seamless as possible and single source that metadata. So let me talk about data synchronization. If you remember that bullet, transmittal and manuscript metadata reconciled. I told you I would be coming back to that. That's sort of the sort of say what problem. I want to look for a moment at the problems of reconciling author information, ORCID information, funding information, and licenses. Let's take a look at authors first. Uh, problem number one is the submitting author doesn't enter all the authors in the submission system. Exhibit A over in the front row here. Uh, you've now got a problem because we've got a transmittal and a manuscript that don't agree with each other, Anthony. You're never going to do this again now, right? Either that or you're just going to give up submitting papers because the administrative burden is too high. Uh, problem number two is that the author list changes during revisions. Well, great, you're going to update that in the Word file, and I'm, I'm using Word as a proxy for whatever format the author is submitting, whether it's Word, tech, or anything else. The author's going to update the Word file, but hey, I'm not going to go back and update that author data in the submission system. That's too much administrative work. So your solution in this is you've got to rely on the manuscript that comes, on the author list that comes in the manuscript. Well, I think that's what most of you have been doing for years, in spite of the conversation I had lunch with, again, a publisher who shall remain unnamed, who said, I'm really trying to take the author list from the online submission system. Well, it gets more complex with ORCID. Imagine the ideal world. Every author has an ORCID, and you've got robust tracking of research funding and publication, and this is what everyone's dreaming about now. And I have to admit, two, three years ago, I was skeptical that ORCID would even get off the ground because there were so many entrenched interests with commercial operations. But it is really starting to take off. So how do you achieve an ORCID for every author? Well, you can request that the submitting author also somehow manage to get an ORCID for every one of the co-authors. Anthony, are you going to do that? You're having trouble getting the co-authors in there. It, it, it's your boss who's doing it. OK, fine. Uh, pass the buck. Um, you can request each author somehow to get their ORCID into this system. Well, imagine you're the submitting author of a paper and you've now got to email every author saying, by the way, can you log on to this online submission system and get your ORCID into this record? I don't think that paper is going to go anywhere very fast. We're trying to get our publication times down, not up. Plus the fact that the ORCIDs have to be authenticated. So in theory, they have to come from each of the individual authors. You could do a lookup of the ORCIDs in production, but again, you've got two problems. The first one, listed second here, is that authentication problem. How do you make sure you've got the right John Smith at Oxford University if there are 20 of them? Uh, but the other problem is today, actually, ORCID promised it would come online just a few weeks ago, but today there's no way to do a, an author name affiliation lookup into the ORCID database to try to get either a single ORCID or at least a list of the John Smiths at Oxford that you could then send to an author and say, hey, which John Smith is this really? So there's a problem of trying to get all the ORCIDs and then line them up. So what happens um, in a few publishers, in a few journals that have gone ahead and implemented ORCID, this is a slide from a presentation by Nature that was given earlier this fall, is they're collecting them uh, at submission, they take them into production, uh, and they're sort of running in parallel, but ultimately they hand the package off to their typesetters, uh, and typesetters are instructed to extract ORCIDs and input into the article XML. Well, that's one slide. From a different nature presentation, I have this slide, and here's the key thing. Typesetter who manually adds the XML ORCID tags into the article XML. That is not a sustainable workflow. And what they're ultimately doing, and this is one of the very few pointy angle bracket slides because I know it's coming up on beer hour and this is not a good time of day for pointy angle brackets, is they're taking that thing, which is a totally opaque number, and they're looking at the name and they're trying to make sure that they match it up correctly in the XML and get it right. Well, they're going to get it right about 97% of the time, but that's a 3% failure rate. By the way, I'm not making up that number out of thin air, not related to ORCID, but I've discovered Crossref pretty consistently has about a 3% failure rate on DOIs. So that's why I'm just sort of coming up with that as an arbitrary number uh, out of thin air. So how do you do the author ORCID reconciliation, where you've got the authors in the manuscript file, you've got the ORCIDs in the transmittal, and the reality today is copy and paste. 
What you ultimately want to think about, however, is a better solution. You want to think about how can I do electronic reconciliation of the transmittal and the manuscript, potentially when you get to the XML phase, where what you could do is take the two, because you're now in an XML stream, you can do some cool things with XSLT, and you can start by comparing the number of authors in the transmittal and the XML and say, ah, I've got six authors in each. Great, then let's compare the author names. Do they all line up in the same order with an exact match? If they do, then great. Let's copy the orchids automatically, author by author, from the transmittal into the XML. That's the kind of right way to system to do this. Of course, this assumes that Anthony has added all six authors at the point of submission. I hear a lot of murmuring around the room. People are thinking about this one. I'm glad I can get you to think this late in the day. Okay. So that's one can of worms. Let's look at the next can of worms, FundRAF. More organizations really want to track funding. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, except uh, to point out there are some URLs if you want to learn more about FundRAF. And also, JATS 1.1, which is imminently due out about the same time that BITS 1.0 is due out, both of them this month. Uh, my apologies, wearing my working group hat, the work was delayed because of the US government shutdown for three weeks. I'm serious, you're laughing, I'm serious. Um, what JATS 1.1 adds that's critical is an institution ID so that you can have both the DOI for a funder, if you've looked at FundRef at all, you know that there's a DOI associated with, with each of these 4,000 funders in the Elsevier vocabulary. You can now have that ID uh, along with the affiliation or the funding agency. Um, funding information, the old way was easy. The author added the funding information to the acknowledgement paragraph, and there were a few publishers out there who actually tagged this in XML, but surprisingly few. Most weren't bothering. Uh, AIP is actually one of the few that's been doing it for a very, very long time. The new way is the author still adds the information to the acknowledgement paragraph. The author may select a funder in the submission system using the controlled vocabulary that comes from Elsevier by way of Crossref. And more publishers are now starting to tag this information because of FundRef. Well, remember this bullet. The transmittal and the manuscript metadata have to be reconciled. Well, the first problem here is the 20% of Evan's authors who are skipping adding this material, this information, when they're doing their submission. The second is that the funder name and the acknowledgement doesn't necessarily use the same name as the controlled vocabulary. So which of the funding information blocks are you going to use, the one from the transmittal or the one from the manuscript? I have a modest example of three uh, acknowledgement paragraphs I grabbed last night out of some manuscripts I had on my laptop. The green is all good. Every single one of these had a match in the cross-ref data that came from Elsevier. The orange is one that's an almost match. If you search for Department of Veterans Affairs, you won't find it. You have to search for US Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, the, I'm sorry, four examples. The third one, Australian National Health and Medical Research Council was not in the Crossref data, but NHMRC was. To tell you the truth, I am not sufficiently confident that those would be the same because the acronym doesn't have an A. That could be some other national uh, Health and Medical Research Council that's not Australian. Um, so I worry about little things like that. And the last one, um, I think actually it came from an AIP paper, um, had five different funders and not one single funder was in the cross-ref list. So how are you going to reconcile this with whatever the person chose? Or maybe they didn't choose anything in the submission system because guess what? They couldn't find a match. So today's reality is that probably most publishers aren't doing any kind of reconciliation because this is all kind of new stuff going on. And what they need to do at a minimum is manual reconciliation and copy editing between the transmittal and what's in the acknowledgement paragraph. If you're being really careful and you want to play by the rules, you're going to go through and every single funder in that acknowledgement paragraph, you're going to go to the Crossref website and look it up on the fundref list and see if it's there and either you're going to find the correct version of it, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, or you're going to report it into fundref.registry at crossref.org. This is sounding like fun, isn't it? Ultimately, you want to build a better solution. Again, you want to look at a way to compare electronically 
the transmittal and the word file, although this is a lot harder than doing with authors because you may have two funders in the transmittal and five actually in the acknowledgement paragraph and trying to pick them off from the free text in the acknowledgement paragraph with a free text search can be a lot more challenging as a regular expression pro programming problem. So ultimately, even if you build something to line all this up and get the tagging done automatically, you're still going to need a copy editor or someone in the process to review to make sure that all funders in the manuscript are tagged, all funders from the transmittal have been matched to something in the manuscript, and all the funding information is tagged correctly. Is this starting to make you guys wish that we were back 25 years ago when it was a lot simpler in a print-based world? Because some of this stuff begins to make my head spin when I think about what's got to be done from an engineering, a software engineering perspective to make it work. Um, a few more examples that are maybe a little less complex. Uh, license information. The old way is you check the copyright forms. Anthony, you did check them once in a while, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Okay. I did. I think other people. Okay. I had a very good way Ah, very good. Um, and then you would print a copyright statement uh, on the final published article that would typically be copyright belong to the publisher, maybe to the author, or occasionally a government um, uh, agency would have to retain copyright because if you're a U.S. government employee, you can't assign copyright for something written on the job to a publisher. The new way is that the author is probably going to tell you something in the submission about whether they want a traditional publication or an open access publication, unless, of course, you're submitting to Hindawi where everything's open access. Um, but then the author's institution may also require a specific OA option, and ultimately you've got to reconcile all of this into a license statement that gets placed in the XML that has the right Creative Commons attributes. And you ultimately want to do this all because you want to get this license information to Crossref in a license ref statement because Crossref is going to start doing some really interesting things with text and data mining, but there are also other reasons for this. There was a paper given at JATSCon 2013. Actually, I have to say, technically, it was the JATS Users Group meeting of 2013. JATSCon 2013 was canceled due to the government shutdown. So about 50 of us got together for a canceled conference and had a great time of it. Uh, and there was a paper, uh, Inconsistent XML is a Barrier to Reuse of Open Access Content, that was written by someone whose side job is working for Wikimedia Commons. And he discovered some really interesting problems with trying to use licensed metadata in uh, the XML that's posted at PubMed Central and also some interesting problems with supplementary material formats. He found a stunningly high number of cases where the attribute information disagreed with the statement in the license paragraph. I checked this out last night just to double check CC BY means that you can also do commercial reuse. Well, the statement in this case said does not permit commercial exploitation. That's inconsistent. So if you're trying to do automatic mining of open access content to see what you can reuse, if you've got something like that, you don't know what you can do with it. And so you're actually causing further havoc down the line if you don't get all of this lined up properly. Um, Another kind of problem that was highlighted, and I apologize for this, this uh, I did my best to try to reproduce the image, is with supplementary media files, they were checking to see if the media type indicated in the attributes in the XML agreed with what the actual file type was. Ahmed, yes, I do see that you have some red there that you're looking at very suspiciously. Um, the only other time I've shown this slide, Rockefeller University Press came up a nice bright green and the guy from Rockefeller in the room was very happy. The rest of you can find this paper online if you want to check yourselves out. But again, what you've got is a reconciliation problem. One piece of data says one thing and one piece of data says something else and they're disagreeing. And this is the kind of problem that's going to come back and start biting you in the tail in fairly large numbers. Wikimedia Commons had really significant problems trying to grab some of the images they wanted because they found that they couldn't rely on the data. By the way, I'm just going to put in a quick plug for those of you. How many of you publish supplementary material? How many of you have read the recommended practices for online supplemental uh, journal article materials? Ooh, that's not good. I do recommend, there's a lot of really good thought that went into this project. I do recommend that you download it and read it. Um, 
thank you, Anthony. I know you're great at reading things that have been posted. Um, th this one is definitely worth taking a look at. So let's come back to Chorus again. And you'll notice a bunch of red boxes getting circled. ORCID, FundRef, LicenseRef, Crossmark, DOI links. All of this is going to work provided you get the metadata right. If you don't get it right, Chorus isn't going to work. And I would be willing to bet that if Chorus doesn't really work, the government's going to come back to those of you who aren't already on PubMed Central and say, guess what, folks, it ain't working. We're opening up our own website. And I don't think that's what you want. So it is ultimately in your best interest to try to figure out how to get all this metadata working correctly. So you really need to pay closer attention to this. So what are your next steps on this? You should probably go back and review the enhanced metadata requirements that I've been talking about. And I haven't covered everything. I've just covered on sort of the 2013 hot buttons. You want to review your workflows to see how you're meeting these requirements. You want to implement reconciliation and QA steps in your workflow. And ultimately, you do want to be implementing all of these new initiatives and depositing your metadata to Crossref. And by the way, one other note, Crossref now does accept abstracts. This is going to be used for text and data mining. Uh, so keep that in mind. So keep up with uh, the latest innovations from Crossref. So finally, what are my conclusions? Uh, first of all, we're not in a world of 25 years ago anymore. We can't just throw print issues over the wall and accept for an occasional correction and retraction. Forget about it. That doesn't exist anymore. We are in this game for long-term long curation of our information. Scholarly publishing is ultimately more integrated than ever before. You're talking to lots of different systems. The integration itself is what's allowing all of these new initiatives to go on. But that integration requires more metadata, not just metadata, but more metadata. And ultimately, the reconciliation and accuracy of that metadata is vital for all of these new initiatives to succeed. So my takeaway for you today is please go back, review and revise your metadata workflow, because I think you'll discover that there are some lurking time bombs there if you don't. Thank you very much. We've got a few, few minutes for questions. Um, I want to back up what Bruce has said really strongly. And I tell you, I have a reason for doing so. Sometime in the last decade, I was asked to do some work by a collection agency, the Publishing Li Publishers Licensing Society, because they had been challenged over the money they were getting from all those um, monies, monies that came into them from all sorts of sources, which they had split up. And the publishers in those days used to get 100% of the money for their journals on the basis that they always claim copyright in the journals. So they had the... Okay. They've been challenged by the authors. Okay. Terrible lot. Yeah. And uh, they had challenged... There were some examples given. Nasty examples. So I was asked to, to get in touch as a trusted person, ho-ho, with uh, a certain number of publishers. And I was given a list... And I was to telephone them and had a script and find out what they were doing with these forms. And at the end of this process, I was totally horrified because I got all my stuff into shape in the 1990s. I mean, it was really... And, I, and these large publishers, not the very large publishers, but medium-sized publishers, had got a total mess. They didn't know where their forms were, how they collected them, and what sanctions they had. Did they, did they go ahead without the forms? Yes, of course they went ahead. They well, wouldn't hold things up, could you? So, a warning. This does... It's important that you are part of this process and you should make sure it happens properly. You want to say something, Evan? Please, go ahead. Um, a couple of news items, since I'm on the Fundref Committee, the Chorus Technical <laughs> Working Group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You forgot the um, JATS Working Group, So I, I have to correct a few things, Bruce, for you. Okay. Um, the first is the next release of the uh, funder list is going from 4,000 to 8,000 funding <laughs> agencies. Excellent. And uh, <laughs> it may go to 12. Um, I suspect it won't stop there. Yeah. 
And the second is something you didn't mention, well, I have a long list. Another that you uh, didn't mention is there is a provision for the submission of a funder name not from the vocabulary. Within your submission system? Within Fundref. Ah, right. Well, I, I gave the email address. Is there also a web form for that? Uh, no, it's, it's in the, the data the publisher can send in. So there is, a, there is a process for evolving the vocabulary and growing it over time. Uh, the problem is that the, we're all having is that the authors make a mistake in the user interface. They're, you know, they're trying to find US Department of Energy and they type DOE and they don't see it, so they type that as a custom name. And so we get garbage in the custom box right. that should have been, uh, was an incorrect lookup. Um, so the vocabulary is growing. There is provision for exceptions and, and then future additions. Um, there is a discussion going on right now about the difference between funding and, uh, of the researcher proper and funding of the facilities in which the researcher the research was conducted and expect to hear <laughs> news on that front coming fairly soon. Um, the vocabulary. Um, yeah. Oh, and then the other thing is there are other workflows being considered by publishers that you didn't describe there. And one that is being actively pursued by a couple of major publishers is not asking the author to identify the funders, but to take the acknowledgments, have their typesetter, typesetting vendor do the lookup, and then on the proofs going back to the author say, here's the list of funders from Crossref, please from Fundref, please mm -hmm. confirm that we have looked up and identified your funders. That, that's a very valid point, but yeah. it, it, it's also not to uh, overlook the point that you now do have to do some sort of name reconciliation, whereas in the past that just wasn't being done at all. Well, right, but the question is, is it better to have your, your paid staff do it than, than the author make mistakes doing it up front? I'll stand so, by the comment I made this morning. The broader the base of people that you have doing metadata, the more open you are for error, so I would opt for having the paid vendor do it yeah, rather than yeah. having the author do the reconciliation. Well, and then you could start that with an automated process. Right. And facilitate it. Anyway, so that's being pursued by some publishers. Um, in the uh, ORCID, um, um, as the, some of the submission systems manage the solicitation of the ORCID ID from the co-authors, so there is already automated solution for that. Right. I, in, I, in I, I'm aware of that, it, although, again, you do have to have the co-authors all sign off on that, yeah. whereas in the past, they, they didn't have to sign off on that additional piece of data. Well, they should have done, but they didn't, no. Well, they do, because the ORCID has to be authenticated. You do have to make sure it's the right John Smith at Oxford. Any other points or questions people would like to make? Because, God, there was a lot of stuff in there, wasn't there? You did a lot of work on that, because you are a good person. And uh, anybody else, or is it time to go home? Well, thank you. Thank you.